Welcome back to my channel, bonjour et re bienvenue sur ma chaîne, my name is Muriel and in this video I will be doing part 2 of my dual review and discussion for the memoirs Le Consentement by Vanessa Springora and Being Lolita by Alison Wood. In part 1 I gave an explanation as to why I read these types of stories, whether it be real life in memoir form or fictional in novel form with books such as Putney by Sofka Zinoviev or My Heart Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. It's because I myself have lived through something very similar. I touched upon this in my 2020 review for My Dark Vanessa, talked a bit about my personal experience in that video, then I gave a bit more information and an update on that personal experience. I also decided to qualify these narratives because I'm such a weirdo as uh, pedo hebophilic grooming narratives or Lolita responsive because more often than not these stories do reference Lolita. They use or reference the archetype of Lolita of the nymphette which was birthed by the eponymous novel by Vladimir Nabokov, even though that novel itself is doing its own thing theme-wise, writing-wise, doesn't in any way, shape or form promote pedophilia or hebophilia or underage sexual abuse or sexual abuse, period, and in fact doesn't even feature grooming in its pages. There is no grooming relationship and Lolita Lolita is kidnapped, never falls in love with her abuser, and does not want to be there at all. And that to me is a very important distinction because the narratives I'm talking about, the Lolita responsive ones, do feature grooming and a victim who is in love with her abuser, whereas Lolita does not. These narratives, however, do respond to that archetype, to this misinterpretation of that masterpiece of English language literature. Thus I decided to call them Lolita Responsive Narratives. And in part one I obviously did my review, critique, discussion around the first memoir, Le Consentement by Vanessa Springora. This memoir has now been translated into English, published into English this year as Consent. In this part I'm going to talk about the second memoir, Being Lolita by Alison Wood. Now I need to put in a very massive disclaimer, because I'm, I'm going to be very critical of this memoir. I did not like it at all. It distressed me quite a bit, it annoyed me, angered me quite a bit. So I need to make something very, very, very clear. I am not in any way, shape or form disputing the fact that the author went through an abusive relationship, that the author was groomed, though there will be a little caveat to that, that the author sadly was raped by her abuser, that this has hurt her, traumatized her, scarred her for life, and that she had to deal with a lot of pain. I wish her all the best in her life, in her endeavors. But I do have issues with the way she chose to present her experience. I said caveat to the word grooming because in my opinion this isn't in fact a, god please forgive me for doing this, a pedo hebophilic grooming narrative. It is not quite a Lolita responsive narrative. Basically it is not in the same group as My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell, Putney by Sofka Zinoviev, Le Consentement by Vanessa Springora, or my own lived experience. It is a different type of traumatic, sexually abusive experience. And I was very personally bothered by the packaging of it, basically, by the title, which I find to be basically false advertising, because I believe that the grooming she went through is what I would call adult grooming, i.e. yes, she was 17 years old when it started, but Overall, it was an adult grooming another younger adult. Not the same as an adult of a certain age grooming a very young teenager slash just out of biological childhood at least. So practically speaking, Being Lolita tells the story of the author being groomed into a relationship with one of her senior high school teachers. She was a vulnerable young woman. I, I will not dispute that because she had a, a very, well I mean I assume heavy because it's not really explored with any depth, a heavy psychiatric past. She was a very very depressed young teenager, so much so that she actually had ECT as a teenager. If you don't know what ECT is, ECT stands for electroconvulsive therapy. It's basically electroshocks but it really isn't as horrible as it sounds. It's been modernized. Even still, usually you reserve ECT for adults and patients who have massive treatment resistant depression. I'm, I'm just, I'm really shocked that she got ECT as an adolescent. 
Okay. And so she went to a um, therapeutic school, but then she chose to go back to her regular high school. And so in her senior year, she met this creative writing slash English teacher, Mr. North. And Mr. North basically started grooming her. And this is where, okay, it is related to Lolita in that sense. For some bloody reason, her abuser had has a weird fetishistic obsession with the novel Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov. In that respect, yes, the, her story is related to Lolita. She herself, however, despite what her abuser told her, was never a Lolita, was never an infect. She was already 17 creeping towards 18 years old and there is no sex that happens before she's 18 so a legal adult that is a pretty massive difference with all the other stories I've mentioned whether again fictional or real life or even my own which doesn't mean it wasn't harmful again mind you remember that disclaimer I'm not saying that it was a healthy relationship I'm just saying it's a different beast it's a different kind of abusive relationship and unfortunately the author because her abuser was weirdly obsessed with Lolita she then tries to shove her lived experience into the mold of a Lolita responsive or pedo Hebrew feeling grooming narrative and really like tries to draw parallels between herself and Lolita not only Lolita the archetype the nymphed but the actual Lolita of the novel by Vladimir Nabokov and that's kind of where it fell apart for me because even the stories which are Lolita responsive aren't actually like the story in the novel Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov, because like I said, there is no grooming in Lolita. There is no teacher-student relationship in Lolita, not that there always is in these narratives. And I mean, in Lolita, Humbert Humbert marries Lolita's mother, her mother dies, and then she's kidnapped and, you know, driven around the freaking country illegally. None of that happened to me or Vanessa Springboha or Vanessa White in My Dark Vanessa or Daphne in Putney. It's a pretty massive difference, like I said, and it certainly did not happened to Ms. Wood. And to me, a, a person who lives something more similar to Lolita, but still fairly different from Lolita, thankfully, to be quite honest, I was borderline offended at some point. I was like, why are you trying to make this into something which it wasn't? Why aren't you being genuine and honest about this experience you had of being in an abusive relationship with a massive asshole who to me was more reminiscent of Christian Grey than Humbert Humbert? And I know what you're going to say, like Fifty Shades of Grey isn't <laughs> the story of an abusive relationship, but hold on, you all know that that relationship in those, I mean, I didn't actually read the books, I just tried to read the first book and I saw the movies. That relationship is fucked in the head. Christian Grey is an abusive asshole and even the BDSM community has disavowed those books. So to me, the comparison holds. So, I mean, the book is basically her relationship, the grooming in high school, then the consummation, if you will, of the relationship. It's full in three parts. And then, so she talks about the relationship itself when she's in, like, freshman year of college. And then there's, like, a little part after she's dumped her abuser and she kind of reflects back on that relationship and then tries to go into a very superficial, I might add, again, might sound mean, but this is my opinion of the novel Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov and obviously I had massive issues with that as well, but I'll get to that. A quick note on the writing though, I am going to sound like a pedantic asshole, like a boomer in the body of a 28 year old, but so be it. What has happened to our collective standard for good English? It's been several times now, I'll come across a book and everyone's raving about how well written it is and I'm like, I didn't think it was that well written. I will give the author points for at times having some elements of lyricism and thoughtful, beautifully evocative passages, but mostly they were few and far between. Oftentimes I found the writing actually quite clunky once again. It felt like I was like, hitting bumps on a road and it's very disagreeable especially since at the very same time as was reading a memoir about depression by an american author named william styron who has since passed away and that was really beautifully written smooth right all along and compared to that this was clunky and i'm like what is it with adverbs not being a thing anymore has there been a collective decision that adverbs are bad now she'll write something i shook his hand strong lee Where's the Lee? Like, I shook his hand strongly, right? That, that's the correct way of doing it grammatically. Like, what the hell is happening with writing? <laughs> so, I mean, the writing was serviceable, is what I'll say. Serviceable with bits and pieces of poetic inspiration. And then <laughs> there are two little things that, that irked me particularly. Thankfully, this didn't actually happen too many times. Uh, there are like two or three times where she's clearly, like, riffing off of Nabokov's style 
for style points or to make a point to like connect her narrative to Lolita. And it felt so forced and so fake. Oh, it was it was so bad. That was genuinely bad. I, I don't know if I can actually find an example of this. So she finishes a paragraph. I, in one of his t-shirts and pairs of boxes, he made me list the others and rank those three penises in size in relation to his own, with his coming up first. So, I assure you, dear reader, he didn't deflower me at all. And that, that is straight up, I could recognize that at her trying to emulate Nabokov. I mean, it's, it's a random example, I know, it's, it's hard to evaluate it coldly like that, but when you're reading the text and then you land on that phrase, it feels so awkward and clumsy as fuck. I mean, I was like, no, you did not just do that. And the second thing that irked me is that, I mean, again, I mean, it's, it's, it's her memoir. She has the right to write it the way she wants. And of course, she's talking about her abuser and she has the right to call her abuser by whatever name she chooses. That's not what I'm disputing here, but she switches between three different ways of, you know, naming her abuser. She switches between the teacher, Nick, and Mr. North. Now, Mr. North and Nick, I get, like, you talk about Mr. North in more informal settings and, you know, she refers to him as Nick in more intimate settings. But then she switches with the teacher. At the very end of her memoir, she explains that it's a coping mechanism mechanism for her which I can respect she explains that it's easier to like depersonalize him and just call him the teacher which fine makes sense after the fact but the weird thing is she mixes this in as she's telling what happened to her when she was 17 18 and at the time presumably she just thought of her abuser as Mr. North or Nick so there's this weird disjointed feeling I got because she was mixing terms which she only got to as she'd gotten out of the relationship to cope with the pain of it and the name she would have given this man as she was in love with him in a relationship with him and it, and it was weird it was, again it was clunky I thought that could have been handled a bit better. I'm not really going to go into positives and negatives like I did for Consent by Vanessa Spingoha because I <laughs> mostly had negatives. So I'll start with like the neutral stuff, just things which weren't present, which I would have appreciated, I guess, being present. She does briefly mention that she had severe mental illness as a younger teenager, so severe. In fact, that she had to have ECT as a teenager, which really freaking shocked me, but apparently it helped her, so I mean, good for her. And she went to therapeutic high school for her junior year. She was also a cutter. I guess, you know, I, I would have enjoyed, it's not the right word, obviously, I would have appreciated a bit more info, a bit more context on her mental illness. For one thing, because I would have found it interesting, it would have helped me actually to relate to her because I myself have struggled with mental illness for most of my life now. But fine, I mean, that wasn't the focus of her memoir. I guess she didn't want to linger on that. And fair enough, I'm just saying that it's something I would have found interesting. The way she presents the portrait of herself at times, I, I felt it was a bit empty, a bit bare bones. Ironically enough, in my dog Vanessa, one of the complaints I had with that novel was that I thought the characterization was a bit lackluster. But in a weird way, I felt like it was slightly better than the sense of character I got from reading a memoir, which is weird <laughs> because a memoir is literally the lived experience of a real life human being, right? But so yeah, I was a bit confused as like, who are are you really as a person beyond you know the fact that you were vulnerable you had a past of a severe mental illness she also mentions she enjoyed like graphic arts painting doing collages but beyond that it was like fairly empty or just very stereotypical young woman or older teenage girl personality there's nothing wrong with that once again i want to make that very clear there's nothing wrong with being that type of person it's just not the type of personality i relate to easily or at all it's a, a more normy type of personality i do not mean it in an offensive way just a bit more normal standard than I am myself. So I, I just have a harder time relating to that. So yeah, that was a bit disappointing to, for me. It won't bother the vast majority of people, I'm pretty sure. And then we get to the more offensive shit, unfortunately. I guess I, I was a bit borderline offended by, again, generally speaking, the way she presented her life experience, the way it seemed to me she was trying to fit it into something it, it wasn't actually. I myself have, you know, these past 18 months, in, in a relatively short span of time, come to the realization, the acknowledgement that I myself have been groomed and raped by a predator who I was in love with, and I mean, pathologically in love with. 
between the ages of 13 and just shy of 20 years old. So a whole piece of my life I have to rebuild in a way. And I mean, again, literature has helped me along on, on this journey. Consent and my dog Vanessa kind of helped me realize intellectually that I was a victim of rape and grooming. Then reading Putney actually brought it home emotionally. That's why Putney was so powerful and cathartic for me. It's one thing to know in your mind that yes, I'm a victim and I was raped. And my very first non-platonic intimate relationship was a massive, well, not necessarily a lie, but just was with a predator who abused me. It's one thing to know it. And then it's another to actually feel it in your soul, in your heart, in your gut. So it's a good thing ultimately, but fuck me, is it painful? So I guess ever since then, I'm a bit sensitive now to these kinds of stories. I approach them just, just a tad bit differently. Like I said, I do acknowledge that the author went through something traumatic and painful. The, the type of abusive experience she had is not the same that I did, or like I said, that Vanessa Spingleha had, or that the characters of Daphne and Vanessa had in their respective novels. Not only is she herself like 17, then 18 years old, a legal adult, her teacher is like 8 years older than her. Now don't get me wrong, young boys, young men can be just as rapey as old creeps. I'm the first one to say this, I was also sexually assaulted by a cousin when I was eight and he was 13. There's no age limit for this kind of phenomenon, sadly. But the thing is, I had a really hard time making a parallel between Mr. North and a character like Humbert Humbert, or a character like Jacob Strain, or my actual abuser who is 36 years older than me. When she's like 17, 18, he's like 26, 27. And that is younger than I am currently. And it was really hard for me to see him as like a predator. He is a predator, but, but not in the same way. Just not in the same way, because even though he has a predatory psychology, age does give you experience to hone your predatory skills. Does that make sense? And so at 26, you don't have those same predatory skills, that same maturity and experience, I guess, as an older predator, like Humbert Humbert, like my abuser, etc., etc. And that's why I, I couldn't picture Humbert Humbert. I pictured Christian fucking Grey from Fifty Shades of Grey. That to me was the parallel. Add to that, it's directly mentioned in her memoir. At some point, she finds herself at a diner with a teacher and a waitress in the diner comes up to their table and they're, I don't know, exchanging love notes or what have you. And she says, oh, never fall out of love, you two. And so I'm like, see, that's another major difference. That never ever would have happened with my relationship. That never ever would have happened between Lolita and Humbert Humbert, or between Vanessa Wyatt and Jacob Strain, or between Vanessa Springora and Gabriel Matzneff. In our cases, it's very clear that there's something weird and dodgy because the person is a lot older. They pass as fathers or creepy uncles. You're never considered a normal couple in those situations. And I'll, you know, I'll go further than that. Even if you're in a consented to healthier age gap relationship, you still will not be looked at the same as Ms. Wood was with her abusive teacher. I don't mind acknowledging that you still, I mean, especially in her case, since she had a psychiatric past, that she was a vulnerable young woman. But like, there's a certain point you have to admit there's a difference between an 18 year old and a 14 year old. There is a difference in psychological maturity and there's most definitely a difference in physiological maturity. At 14, you might just be finishing puberty, depends on the person, obviously. Normally when you're 18, you're done with puberty unless you have a medical condition, which I don't think was the case for the author. In fact, the author mentions pretty clearly the size of her breasts, the fact she has stretch marks on her breasts and her hips from, you know, rapid growth, I assume. I mean, that was actually quite disturbing for me to read. I kind of had secondhand dysphoria from reading that, to be honest. And you cannot mention that in a chapter and then 10 pages later say, I was an innocent child raped by an older man, especially when she's a legal adult when they have sex. No, I'm sorry, no. You were not a child. Maybe slightly psychologically, I'm willing to give that, but you were certainly not a child in the way I was when I was 13. I'm sorry, no, no, it's a different kind of experience. And that's where I found it borderline offensive because it felt like, I hate myself for using this overused word, it felt like appropriation. And I don't really understand why though, because her experience is legitimate as it stands. There are sadly, I might add, myriad different kinds of sexual violence, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, 
abusive relationships. I also read, not that long ago, a graphic memoir called Speak, the graphic novel. I have a review for that if you're interested, that I found very moving. And that memoir centers around a young girl who was raped at the age of 13 by an older high school student. And it was a more straightforward rape. There was no grooming, there was no relationship with said rapist. That is a type of sexual violence that I didn't go through personally, yet I could still relate and feel things for that young person and feel feel sorry for her and for her experience. But I can also acknowledge that it's, it's a different kind of experience. And here, I think the author had a traumatic experience. She was raped by her abuser. She was groomed as a young woman by an older man, but it's just not the same kind as what I call the Lolita responsive narratives, as the Peter hemophilic grooming narratives. It's just not that. And then I, I do want to actually read the paragraph, which kind of broke it for me. Years later, I will be able to articulate that pain during sex has nothing to do with sexual inexperience. It's about your partner being too rough. I bled after sex with the teacher because I was a child. I was barely 110 pounds. I had been only with other teen boys, all of us children. I was 18, but that didn't matter. All intents and purposes, I was still pubescent. The teacher was definitely not. There was no fear, no gentleness on Nick's part. He wasn't careful in the ways I was used to. Before, sex was brimming with fear, of being caught, of causing pain, both emotional and physical consequences, fear of regret. My body was simply not prepared for the force or the aggression of sex with a grown-up. At 18, I didn't understand my body. I was ashamed of it. I didn't realize that it was doing exactly as it should have, looked exactly as it should have, that I was perfectly acceptable exactly as I was. At 18, I understood none of those things. There's so much that is, in my opinion, wrong with that paragraph. It's a hot mess of confusion and mixing things. Just in those three first phrases, I completely agree that painful sex is on the partner, you should be gentle, you should be attentive to your partner's rhythms, wants, etc, etc. And then she says, I bled because I was a child. There is so much that is just actually incorrect about that sentence. And that contradicts the beginning of her paragraph. She herself acknowledges that she bled because the sex was too rough. And, and that's, that's on her abuser, right? She didn't bleed because she was a child. And she wasn't a child. That's the thing, though. You're 18 years old. You're a legal adult. You've shared with the readers the size of your breasts, how wide your hips are, how womanly your body is. And then you say you bled because you're a child. I'm sorry, I cannot take that seriously. I can't. No! And my body wasn't prepared for sex with a grown-up. It doesn't mean anything. That's the thing, though. Again, just because you've had prior sexual experience does not mean you can't be raped afterwards. That's not what I'm saying. But again, she's had sex three times by the time she has a relationship with this teacher. So she's not a virgin. She's had some sexual experiences. She's had boyfriends. This is miles away from what I lived through, what the characters of Vanessa White and Daphne lived through, and what Ms. Sprangora experienced with her abuser. We were all basically coming out of childhood. We had no prior sexual experience, or if it was, it was childhood stuff, or it was, well, in my case, it was actually also abusive stuff, but whatever. I'd never had boyfriends. I'd never had sex. My body was literally not ready for sex with a grown-up. That's, again, a pretty massive difference between the type of abusive experience Ms. Wood had and the one I had and which I've talked about in all these other books. It's weird, it's like, because she was groomed, she was underage and a minor, but that's not how it works. You can be groomed as an adult. I don't understand what the author was trying to do here. Yeah. I guess since her abuser was obsessed with Lolita, she kind of latched onto that as a coping mechanism, maybe? And a quick little insert from my editing self. I seem to be somewhat close to the truth with that statement because the author herself drops towards the end of her memoir this paragraph. Sometimes I worry if the whole Lolita intertextuality is just a conceit, a clever way to elevate what happened to me, to raise it above the tawdry. I still wonder if I have just exaggerated things, if I am the unreliable narrator in the story, if I truly did seduce him, if this Lolita concept is just crafted to give this relationship meaning. Now, obviously, once again, she is not responsible for her abuse. As such, I don't think she seduced her abuser. She was, in fact, groomed. However, by that point, I was somewhat rage-reading through the memoir, and I thought to myself, well, isn't that an interesting little nugget of dazzling self-awareness? But 
In any case, it doesn't change reality. Though. You can't just change facts to suit your own feelings in a way. She says, you know, I was 18, but despite that, I was still basically pubescent. I'm sorry, no, you weren't. Pubescence is a specific word of the English language that has a specific meaning. It's a medical term. You are not pubescent normally anymore when you are 18 years old. You're just not. And, you know, I was really, really angry as I was going through the memoir progressively. I was like, okay, this is a different kind of story. But then she really pushed that spin, I guess, on her narrative and the parallels to Lolita. Now, now, I get it, her abuser had a weird fetishistic obsession with the novel, I'm not disputing that, and my theory, which she kind of alludes to herself in her book, is that her abuser used her as training grounds to go after younger girls, and thus he had this weird obsession with Lolita, with the misinterpretation, I should say, of Lolita the novel. But she herself was never a Lolita. She was never a nymphette. I mean, even in the novel Lolita, nymphettes are described as going from 9 to 14 years old. I, I can't really speculate on what went through her mind. I'm, I'm not her. But I, I was just really confused by how she could miss some of the things in the novel. I mean, obviously she was groomed and manipulated. I'm willing to acknowledge she was very emotionally vulnerable from a history of mental illness. But like, okay, the first time I read Lolita, I was... I think 15, maximum 16 years old. I was very much infatuated with my abusive teacher. That being said, despite the fact that I probably didn't interpret Lolita quite the same way I do today, even at the time, I spotted the fact that Humbert Humbert was a perv. I was touched by like the tragic unrequited love story aspect of it and I was like probably more lenient towards Humbert Humbert, but even at the time I could tell, yeah, okay, this guy has a problem. There's a point in Lolita and this really struck me back then. It, it stuck in my mind all these years for a reason. He starts, you know, fancy about marrying Dolores Hayes, impregnating her, and then fucking the child, I mean, the female child, presumably, as soon as it hits the age of eight or nine. And I was like, that's disgusting. <laughs> and like I said, I myself was 15, 16, in a grooming relationship and with a heavy history of psychiatric illness, as well, I might add. And I was still capable of going, that's fucked. <laughs> when I read it as a teenager. And the author didn't spot this at all. She does admit that she'd never actually read through the book in its entirety back then. She just kind of read passages because her abusive teacher boyfriend read them to her. So I guess she never really herself took an interest in the novel at the time. But still, I don't know, it, it was weird to me. Like, how could you miss those bits? Like, even if you're taken in by the mystique of it and by the manipulation of your abuser, like, I was capable of spotting that. And, and you know, that, that's actually one of the reasons I never identified with Lolita, even as I myself technically was an infet, a Lolita, if you want to go with that archetype, that imagery. I technically was one, and I never identified with her because I felt she was a very different person than I was. She wasn't in love with Humbert Humbert. It wasn't a love story in that sense to me. Lolita didn't love her abuser. She was kidnapped. Her mother died. When I thought about my love story with my abuser, like, I didn't use Lolita as a point of reference. I was, like, tripping off of Eloise and Abelard and, I don't know, Lady Charlie's lover and things like that. Yeah, there were elements of Lolita that spoke to me, but ironically enough, those became more prevalent in the second relationship I had with an older man, which was not abusive, but my ex, who I, I still have a lot of affection for, also kind of had a problem. And so he was very taken in with the novel Lolita and had very questionable interpretations of it. I'll now be concluding with just a bit of commentary on what bothered me with regards to the author's interpretation of the novel Lolita and some of the comments she made about its author Vladimir Nabokov. Overall, I just thought it was a fairly superficial analysis. It didn't go into that much depth overall throughout the pages of her memoir, putting aside the fact that her lived experience did not in fact mirror the experience Dolores Hayes goes through in the novel Lolita. I just thought her appreciation of the literary material was fairly surface level. And you could say, that's just one person's opinion about a novel. Why are you making such a fuss? Because through these kinds of memoirs, which are elevating victims' voices, and that is always a good thing, mind you, a lot of people now are just going off of her or other people's words on a book which they then will not even bother reading themselves and thus constructing a critical opinion about. 
Apparently she teaches Lolita in college, but the thing is, she doesn't even make her students read the entire novel. That is offensive to me, alright? Like, what the hell is this kind of lazy teaching? You're not even making your students at the college level read an entire freaking novel. Are you freaking kidding me? Come on. She said that the novel is beautiful, agree there, but it is also problematic, I'll get to that in a second, and it's overly long and thus she doesn't make her students read the entirety of it. And I'm like, Come on. What is problematic is, bear with me, lazy-minded people who can't be bothered to read the book themselves, but just then assume it's an apology of pedophilia or of abusive underage relationships, because it is not. What's problematic is massive creeps using this novel to justify their fantasies, to project said fantasies onto the novel, and then reabsorb it to, you know, then again, like I said, justify bad, even criminal behavior. That's what's problematic. It's the intellectually lazy interpretation or the morally corrupt interpretation of that piece of literature. That's what's problematic. The book itself, I will maintain until the day I die, is not problematic. Especially when you consider the fact that there are books out there which are truly problematic. Brilliant example, the books of Gabriel Matzneff, which I touched upon in part one of this dual review. The dude actually freaking wrote and got published by reputable publishing houses in France, books which promote pedophilia. Straight up. He waxes poetic about going to the Philippines and raping ten-year-old boys. He explains the wonders of the third sex, which is young people between the ages of 10 and 16 in a book titled The Under 16s. That, my dear friends, is problematic literature. Lolita is not. So yes, obviously I was going to be a bit miffed about that since that is kind of a central thesis in the book and what I tolerated even less is some of the comments she drops about the author Vladimir Nabokov. She intersperses little bits and pieces about the author, which bothered me because one, there's no context given for those statements, two, they're unverifiable within the text, and three, one of those statements present towards the end of the memoir even kind of veers into ascribing nefarious intent to the author based on the fact he wrote a novel like Lolita, and I have zero patience for this. I have talked about my relationship to the concept of death of the author and ascribing authorial intent in other videos, most notably my book review for The Mists of Avalon by Marin Zimmer Bradley, and in that case the author genuinely was a piece of shit human being, though the book itself isn't, it's a masterpiece. And so I'll read the paragraph that particularly rubbed me the wrong way. While I can tell myself that drawings were made from love, Nabokov watched these butterflies for hours, caught and released with soft white mesh they could survive, and drew and painted them with water and marine care, the photographs are proof that, for him, love didn't always mean hearts beating. Just straight up, what the hell am I supposed to make of that kind of statement? So what? Because Nabokov was apparently a fairly well-respected lepidopterist who collected butterflies and then shared set collections with institutes such as the Natural History Museum in New York, I think, if I understood that correctly, or at least collections from, you know, the University of Cornell. That means he had a problem with human empathy? With being a pervert? Like, what? That, I'm sorry, is the kind of level of thinking I would expect from an actual teenager. And I'm sorry, I don't want to sound off mean, I don't want to insult the author, this is not the point of this video, but come on. This is basic shit. I have a freaking blue morpho in a box in my bedroom. Does that mean I have have a problem with empathy and I'm what, a pervert? Are all the world's entomologists who, well, you know what, collect insects for a living to study them, etc., are they sociopaths? Do they have an issue with loving something that has a heartbeat? Just, what? If you use that kind of logic, then any kind of author who writes anything that's slightly violent or creepy or psychologically disturbing, they themselves have a problem. So, I mean, you can put all thriller writers in the loony bin, basically. The dude who wrote the Hannibal Lecter series apparently has a fridge full of brain at home. Like, can we stop with that kind of reasoning? Just stop. Yes, Nabokov collected butterflies. So, so what? And yes, putting pins through them and putting them in boxes is part of, like, the practice of entomology. Don't get me wrong, I'm not super 
just about the idea of killing bugs to study them. I'd rather we not. But ironically enough, she herself mentions in the first half of that paragraph that he actually took care to capture them softly and gently so he could release them after he painted them. So what the hell? <laughs> just what the hell? Can we not go there, please? Can we just not ascribe that kind of weird psychology based off of a passion, a hobby, which a lot of people have? And it doesn't make them sociopaths or pedophiles or perverts or what have you. So all in all, you can probably tell by now after this rambling review, apologies for that, that I did not like this memoir at all. Remember that disclaimer I put at the beginning of the video, I wish this author the best of luck on her road to health, healing and happiness, but I took a massive issue with the way she chose to present and package her lived experience of abuse as a young woman at the hands of a slightly older man. And I also happen to disagree with her, I mean partly, the interpretation of Lolita and the way she decided to view its author, Vladimir Nabokov. I would give this one a pass, quite honestly. To me, the title is false advertising, plain and simple, though I'm not saying that's the author's fault. I've recently learned that actually, unless you're like a heavy lifter, an author doesn't get to choose the title of the books, which I find deeply disturbing, but okay. In the end, I gave Being Lolita a 3 out of 10. And I forgot to add this at the end of part one, I gave Le Consentement by Vanessa Springora a 7 out of 10. I bumped it up from a previous 6 to 6.5 out of 10 back in 2020. These were both fairly difficult memoirs to go through for different reasons. I would definitely recommend Le Consentement and once again not recommend Being Lolita, but ultimately you know yourselves the best. Maybe you'll relate to her story, maybe you think it doesn't actually matter whether she was 18 or 14 and that there is absolutely no difference between those age categories. We're free to disagree with one another, that's what's brilliant about a free society. But honestly, like, if you want a good, you know, hemophilic grooming narrative, a good Lolita responsive narrative, there are better ones out there. Platini by Sof Kazanoviev, my Dark Vanessa by K. Elizabeth Russell, of course Le Consentement by Vanessa Springora. And as to a memoir or story concerning itself with adult on adult, albeit younger adult, grooming and abuse, I'm sure there are many stories out there you could find and relate to if you need to, or if you're just curious about these kinds of narratives. So on that note, I hope that despite this video's profoundly rambly nature, I hope you found it interesting informative, gave you perhaps added insight into these types of narratives, including, you know, information I interjected about my own personal lived experience. In any case, I hope you have a lovely day, evening, or whichever time of day you prefer, and I shall see you in the next video, which will undoubtedly be my April reading wrap-up. Bye-bye!